This is a quick guide to the Pollier M1, a single-engined biplane fighter of World War I. It can be regarded as a sort of spiritual predecessor to the Ario HD1 and shares much of the same history. As such, you are recommended to view my video on the HD1 in order to get more context regarding what I will be saying here. I wouldn't normally put out a second video so soon after the last one, but one of my subscribers requested that I do something about the Ponier M1, and given that it intertwined with the story of the HD1, it was already entrenched in my mind. Incidentally, if you like this presentation, please subscribe. If all my unique viewers were to do so, I would be a long way towards making this channel a success. I do not have, uh, nor have been able to find, pictures of most of the participants in this tale, uh, so for now, here's a picture of René Henriot. In brief, René Henriot was faced with bankruptcy in 1913 and sold the assets of his company to Louis Alfred Pornier, who had been the Henriot's chief designer. Ponier reorganized, and the company continued to produce aircraft under the new mark. Ponier, along with chief designer Alfred Pagny, had some success during the brief period between 1913 and 1914. Pagny had been a designer for Newport, and as a result their most famous aircraft of this period had a more than superficial resemblance to those aircraft. The Ponier D3 came second in the Gordon Bennett Trophy competition of 1913, losing out to Depart du Saint, which was no mean feat given the excellence of their racing monoplanes. And yes, I do have a video on that. By the outbreak of World War I, it can reasonably be claimed that Ponier had some experience building good aircraft, mostly monoplanes, but also the F-1 biplanes, the latter being the first aircraft to bear his name. Like any self-respecting manufacturer, Ponier had been interested in military contracts. Just prior to the commencement of hostilities, Pagny had designed the L-1, which has been called a biplane conversion of the D-3 racing monoplane. Despite its apparent merits and a successful first flight in July 1914, it was not successful. At this point, Emile Eugène Dupont enters the picture, and the connection to the Ario HD1 is complete, because he later went to work for René and designed that aircraft. I've commented on Dupont previously due to some confusion as to his full name, but Emile Eugène is the majority opinion, and lacking information otherwise I shall henceforth refer to him as such. Work commenced on the design of the Ponier M1 most likely in 1915, with its first flight probably late that year, as Charles Nungesse test flew the aircraft in January 1916. While Emile Eugène Dupont is generally credited with the design, it is actually unclear how much of it is really his. The rudder, tailplane and elevators are virtually identical to the Ponier Pagny Gordon Bennett monoplane of 1913 illustrated here, so it seems likely that Alfred Pagny was either directly involved in a collaboration or Dupont just took them because they were available. It has been called an ugly, ill-proportioned, and frail-looking little aircraft. However, I personally find it to be rather good-looking. It's certainly a more modern-looking design than the precursor L1, made to look streamlined by the addition of a large propeller spinner. In fact, to me, it looks rather like the Oreo HD1, but with that propeller spinner attached. In truth, one might reasonably expect there to be some similarity, given that the two aircraft share a designer, which makes the rather disparaging remarks somewhat inexplicable. It was technically a fairly typical aircraft of the period. It was a single-engine tractor configuration biplane, equipped with an 80-horsepower Le Rhone 9C rotary engine, driving it to a top speed of a moderately respectable 104 miles per hour. The wings were of a single base setup, of unequal span, and slightly staggered with the upper wing forward of the lower. Cutouts helped the pilot's visibility both above and below. 
It featured aluminium panels around the forward fuselage, though the rest of the skin was traditional fabric. If you've watched my HD1 video, this will all sound very familiar. An immediate concern regarding the construction was the rather small tailplanes. This came back to bite the design rather severely, as we shall see. Armament was a single 7.7mm Lewis machine gun. Interrupter gear was still in its infancy, so as was common practice, the gun was mounted above the upper wing, fixed and firing forwards clear of the propeller arc. This is not an ideal location, but many other aircraft types were similarly equipped, so this cannot be considered a deficiency. On January 29th, 1916, future famed fighter ace Charles Nungesse test flew a Poignier. The flight was brief and disastrous, and Nungesse was extremely lucky to survive. Shortly after takeoff, the aircraft went into a spin, and his failure to recover from this is attributed to the totally inadequate rudder. Having said that, apparently his starting altitude was around 200 meters, which doesn't give much room to maneuver. The aircraft was completely destroyed. Nungese suffered multiple injuries that required two months from which to recover, having broken both his legs and his jaw. Another test pilot, the highly experienced Jean Navarre, also flew the aircraft and found it to be demanding and unstable, saying he considered himself lucky to get back down alive. Now, a single crash and a bad report at the outset isn't necessarily enough to condemn an aircraft. The history of aviation is replete with examples. Take a look at the Sopwith Camel, which had some truly lethal flight characteristics. Nonetheless, French official interest came to an abrupt stop. As the problem with the aircraft was identified as being the trail planes, these were enlarged. At this point, the Belgian military steps into the story. Their aviation militaire was notoriously unable to acquire decent front-line fighters, and lacking the up-to-date Nieuport then being fielded, turned to Ponnier to make up the shortfall. According to Willy Coppens, the later leading Belgian fighter ace, this decision was the responsibility of a Major Louis Tournay. Apparently Major Tournay was later put into a position not to have to make such decisions anymore. Thirty were ordered, but even with the modifications mentioned previously, they proved to be operationally useless and withdrawn from service within two weeks. It is often stated that a negative report from Willy Coppens helped to damn the type, but this seems as unlikely, as in 1916 he didn't have the reputation he was later to acquire. Most likely the general deficiencies of the type were sufficient to condemn it. Of the 30 ordered, perhaps 18 were actually delivered, with a couple apparently being used as trainers by the French. Uh, they were reportedly unpopular in this role. The oddity of the Ponnier M1 story is that a designer such as Emile Eugène Dupont, who went on shortly afterwards to design the excellent and rather similar Henriot HD1, would have worked on an aircraft that has come down through history as a disaster. I suspect, but have no supporting information to back me up, that there's more to the tale than I have been able to find out. Needless to say, there are no known surviving examples. <laughs>